Hey, Gabriel. Hey, Gabriel Jose. Where are we today? Today, we are in one of our favorite bars of San Francisco. Uh, one of the two, well, there's three, I guess, <laughs> go-to bars. Okay, yeah, that's fair, uh, that's fair. The, after the, a year. After a year, yeah, yeah. They've been doors closed for since March. Well, yeah, well, they had like, a, I don't know, you remember, like that time when they so free open. They had like a speakeasy, mm -hmm. but only on the patio. It wasn't indoors. Mm -hmm. Well, there were people indoors, but yeah, let's just see that probably there were some legal stuff <laughs> involved on here. They were serving food. It was a loophole. That's true, that's true. Uh, but yeah, no, the bar is actually the Lomister that uh, we actually recorded here like, a couple of times already. And the... Uh, the thing is, uh, what it was. Okay. Uh, what did we watch today? Oh dear God! We watched six hours of Boz Lerman films. Uh, you, you had seen all three? No, I hadn't seen Strictly Ballroom. I had seen. Romero oh, okay. Yet. So yeah. we both lost our Strictly yeah. Ballroom cherries, and then we rewatched <laughs> Romeo and Juliet. Mm-hmm. And Moulin Rouge because we're gay. Yep. Well, I gave you a choice. <laughs> I gave you a choice out of three, and you actually picked like both of them, the three of them directly. I, th I, in my opinion, I was afraid we wouldn't have enough to talk about if we were just we talking just about one. one film, and so I was like, why don't we just watch all three and yep. see how we and feel? Yes, go completely out of hand. And I will say that we've we've had podcasts that have been multi-hour endeavors before yep. recording, and this felt easier than. This didn't feel like work. And some of the times, like Twin Peaks, it was like, shit, I've got to watch seven hours of this. Well, yeah, because there are movies, you know, and it's a bit more like a single unit, so you were only watching three single units. And it's very... You don't have to think in any of these no, movies. No, no, there is no, like, a, it's not like an Ima Berman kind of thing about, like, does the immediate Imalin Rus represent anything specific? Do like, not no? bring up death. <laughs> no, okay. Uh... But yes, this was my pick. I should actually justify why you didn't pick this. But I was thinking after we watched uh, L, I was thinking about like, just watching something a bit more uplifting. So I said, for me, plus you did, I thought that the other two were going to be like pretty a bit and pretty enjoyable. They were fucking downers. Yeah, actually, yeah. And that's something <laughs> I, I had wanted. forgotten. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I remembered about. Uh, uh, Moline Roos that it starts like at the beginning like super depressing and then it has like super chaos and sunny you know and then it starts like just going through the movie like just going darker and darker you know and I think that that's a bit more of a pattern that he likes to use that in the three movies there is actually that kind of pattern about like the first act is that it's pretty crazy and silly and doesn't try to make like anything you know like too serious and then the second act is like okay I'm going to be like presenting the conflict but I'm going to be like telling you is that they're not going to be ending 100% happy Strictly by Rome they almost do it's pretty I would yeah. say that's a feel good ending yeah it's a feel good ending but yeah. they don't win but they were their true selves. That's true. They embraced themselves <laughs> and then everyone dies. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, the reason what I wanted to do uh, was this because I felt like they were going to be a bit more of a visual spectacle. That is like what we actually assume from Baz Luhrmann. And we actually came from several directors that we said that there is not heavy-handed direction here. And is that there is nothing more heavy-handed than Romeo Plus Juliet and, uh, and, how do you say, and uh, Molly Bruce. Well, we certainly got heavy-handed directing here. Oh, yeah. That's true. Yeah. So, as this is the first time that we actually analyze not one, but two, sorry, not one, not two, but three movies, is so we're going to start like, discussing them chronologically. And so, how, in what order did you watch them? I wasn't in the chronological order. I wanted, like, the just curtain. I wanted to just understand this. Okay, this guy did, like, a very small movie in 93. I think that is, like, a strictly ballroom. Is that he did, like, this 92, actually. Yeah, wow, that's crazy. In 92 in Australia. And then someone trusts him with a crazy budget for Romeo. Plus, you did. He said, what? What happened? Like, how promising was the movie for people to say, it's like, this guy has done it. And while I was watching Strictly Ballroom, I really tried to pay attention like there's this small Australian director and yep. somebody was like come over take all our A-list talent and make this movie that is a big big gamble 
A list, that's not fair. I that's get true. it. <laughs> but in any case, that's true. There is a gamble, and it's something that I wanted to discuss later with Romeo plus Juliet, because it's like, I think that is, and we discussed this a long time ago, I think that is a crazy experiment, like, there has not been any other in the history of cinema. If this experiment that needed to be done or not, that's a different question. But it's experiment. So, Romeo plus Juliet came out in 96, and yep. it's still visually, like, shocking. Yep. Yeah. And Molly Bruce is, like, he's incredible from the perspective of how, like, visually, he's, like, he holds his weight. Like, so, the instructive album, I think that is, okay, the budget is pretty clear, low, but you can still see, like, how the colors, like, try to pop up, how the sparkles are everywhere. It's, like, all these kind of close-ups where you see, like, the sparkles in the eyes of the character. It's, like, you have a style. You want everything to sign. And I think he didn't have the money for the special effects. He probably would have put into into Strictly Ballroom oh, yeah. that we saw, like, in Romeo plus Juliet, where he's like, I have money, I'm going to do this. And, oh, yeah. yeah. Like, going completely crazy, like crazy sets, you know. He's like, he actually, it's pretty clear that he loves Golden age Hollywood, you know, like making like crazy sets, like crazy layouts, like in uh, a strictly ballroom when he dance and you see like everyone dancing at the same time, that is like, that's the classic style that you will see in a musical. You know, Just like La La Land. Exactly. Like yep. La La Land, but 30 years later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in any case, did you start also with the Strictly Ballroom? I did. Uh, I started with that one. I figured it was chronological, but I was like, let's start with this one. And I knew Romeo plus Juliet. Yeah, so I guess Juliet, I, 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 I... It was a guess, but I assumed it was chronological. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what was Strictly Ballroom about? Strictly Ballroom takes place in a universe where everybody for some reason cares about ballroom dancing. <laughs> I mean, it's almost like just watching Friday Night Lights when it's like everyone cares about yes, like high exactly. school football. And it's like, this is a stupid, but it makes some kind of sense. I think, I think that he's actually just making fun about like, yeah. imagine a wall. Well, this is the most important thing. So it's actually a mockumentary. It, is like it starts it, but yeah, then but it just the gives thing, up on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I feel like they were surprised because there was a very, like, this is a spinal tap that I think that is like, the mother mockumentary, you know, from 89 or something like that, from the director of Best in Show, Michael Guest, I think that is his name. And it's like, Best in Show is from 1999, and he's like, this is like pretty close the beginning when they are uh, interviewing everyone is like he's pretty close to that style i haven't seen either of those films but i will take your word for it i yep. have seen other mockumentaries like the vampire one oh what we do in the shadows yes yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, you know the style i but do this one is like he didn't commit completely to it like yeah he it just kind of with it and he's like now we're going back to a regular movie yeah so, I mean, let's take turns describing the plots. Sure. Um, so, again, this is a, a community that cares about ballroom dancing. There is... I'm not going to remember any of these names. <laughs> There's the main dancer. He's France. 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 Yeah, France. So, France that is... a very Spanish name. Oh, that makes sense now. No, it's not. It's not a Spanish name. Why was he so drawn to the Spanish? <laughs> I, I have no idea. <laughs> but that's one of my pet peeves with this movie. But yeah, sorry. So that this community, they love uh, dancing. Yes. Yeah, so there's there's this um, there's this boy. He's a man actually, and he's been training since he was six to win a very prestigious ballroom dance competition. And kind of the mockumentary style um, is his mother and some other characters that surround him that are horrified that he went off script in an ev earlier competition yep. and did moves that were not strictly ballroom mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he was just thrilled that he got to be himself but his partner who also hopes to win this this major competition is just Horrified. disgusted yep. with him yep. Yep. and yep. and the over the top comedy i'm just going to say now i never once laughed out loud but i was impressed with this humor like it's it's funny <laughs> it's not laugh out loud funny for me but it's like okay this is clever like yep. and you got the right cast and yep. you got he clearly directed them to these performances, which I was very impressed with. Yeah, it's like he's. I would say that actually, he's like he's funny. He's funnier than he has the right to be, but you're not going to be there laughing out loud. And yeah. there is nothing, you know, like completely memorable. It doesn't try to reinvent any genre. And there's no like one-liners. I think maybe if I watched it ten times, I would. It's not like that sort of funny, but it's it's clever in yeah. its humor. Yeah. Um, so his partner abandons him, and 
sorry, did you watch? Sorry to interrupt you because I need to ask you this before I forget. But did you watch? And before you mentioned that this Australian director, and then he actually went to uh, to Hollywood to just do like a big budget movie. Did you watch any of the Peter Jackson movies before he actually came to Hollywood? Like the gory ones. I've seen Heavenly Creatures. But that was already here, no? It was like his no, no, no. Movie. It's a New Zealand film. Oh, it's in New Zealand? Okay. So maybe that was... That's the one that I haven't watched from here. And I was very confused why Kate Winslet was in New Zealand, but that's neither <laughs> here nor there. <laughs> okay. I was thinking, there is another director. I will think about it later. Also Australian. Well, uh, that guy, Peter Jackson, is from New Zealand. But that they hear... Oh! Did you watch Muriel's Wedding? It's also from the same year, Tony Collette. Like, yeah, I know of it, but it's yeah. just not my. It's not my. Honestly, I also said the same, and it, I have like the same feeling about like there is something about like seeing the Australian reality that I feel so, so, trashy. That is, like, this is incredible. If I watch a movie from the nineties from any other country in the world, I don't feel so repulsed about it. But it's not nearly as good as R- Rover. I just. Just calling that out. Okay. <laughs> but I think that they actually just fester on it. About, like, we're going to be like, making fun of ourselves about like, how trashy we look. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, I love that. I love that. So, sorry. So... The partner is horrified. The partner's horrified, and he she doesn't want to dance with him. She goes to be dance partners with somebody who has already won this competition. Um, and this homely girl who's brand new to ballroom dancing she's only been dancing for two years so she doesn't have a partner yet she is very like enamored by his individual style and she says i want to dance with you he laughs she's like give me an hour and he's like he ends up both falling in love with her and also her skills you know skyrocket and she just really encourages him to to be who he is and they know that they can't win the competition but they have this camaraderie and then at some point, his first partner comes back to him and wants to dance in the competition, and his whole family's like, yeah, you have to do it because you have to win. Oh, no, 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 no. Is he actually is like this, supposed to be dancing with this legendary female dancer that her partner yeah. is retiring? So it's, like, it's, it's a bit more like a sitcom kind of situation about like, nothing of this makes sense. It's sunniness. That's like Buzz Lerman. You know, I think that is like his stand. Yeah. So... So she is Spanish, his, uh, the, the, the new partner. I was going to ask you about the this. The parents are actually, uh, well, the grandmother and the father, is, uh, they certainly have a Spanish accent. That I felt like, wow, you guys, is like, when I actually see a movie in, uh, in the States, and they say, that, oh, my parents are from Spain, is that they're Mexican. They are 100% Mexican. This I was like, wow, okay, no, they're from Spain. They talk about Paso Doble, that is a style that is from Spain. You know, is that that's... Okay, now, Fran, the accent that she has is infuriatingly terrible. Well, also, she doesn't look like her parents at all. Like, no. she's clearly just a white Australian, which is <laughs> <Exactly>. very weird. <laughs> is that we had to actually just choose someone that could dance, and it could look good in the camera. Because otherwise it was going to be like the grandmother. So, ultimately, he's supposed to dance in this competition with the rock star partner, but then he decides he'd rather go with his love and do his own moves, which... Spoiler alert, they do, they fall in love, they don't win the competition, but they won the hearts of everyone at the competition. Because they taught them that it's better to just have fun while you're dancing instead of just falling. And be yourself. Exactly, not Mm -hmm. falling the steps. So, I mean, there's there's a lot that I left out. This is the overall plot. Um, I don't think... The details are that important because it's not a strong story. Uh, yeah, the parents were also dancers. That's the reason why he actually needed that, you know. But there is nothing that you would say is groundbreaking. Yeah, I, it's, it's entertainment. It's clever entertainment. Um, I was worried it was going to feel like work. It didn't. I mean, I was also working at the time. But um, yeah, I, I don't know what else there is to say about this film from a personal aspect. I didn't find it very funny. I did find it clever in some situations. I don't, for instance, not to jump to our questions already, there's not a rewatchability there for me. Um, But I did appreciate it. Even then, before I had seen the other two films, I I saw, okay, this is where Boz Lerman came from. And it felt a lot like, again, we talk about Steve McQueen so much, but I was like, "This this is Boz Lerman's hunger. And like... This is possibly where he's the most interesting, but like it's also where he started growing from. 
Do you think these are the most interesting movie that he did out of the three? No, no, no. I'm saying like that's what I felt when I watched yeah. it. I was like, okay, at least I'm starting to understand this director like yeah. in a different way. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, it was like, okay, this guy had. He's not country. Let's just be completely clear. But it's like he actually has a very strong visual language. And very likes, strong. Yeah. He likes to abuse out of it. You know, like the slow motion, the fast pace from time to time, like just making something crazy. Is like he knows how to use this. He almost feels like just a very classic director. You know, he comes from. I mean, it's pretty clear that he actually just learned from the 40s and the 50s when the cinema started just being like color. You know, and it was like all the colors were like hyper saturated. So all, like, They're movies of color. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I, I realize when I say that it, it's like no, that word has a different meaning here. Uh, and I really like him, but I mean, I read, I like it. You know, as you said, it's like it's enjoyable, enjoyable to watch. You don't have to pay like too much attention, but at the same time, it's like I. I had a good time. You know, like, oh yeah, that's, that was fun. It was like a fun movie to watch. I, I feel exactly the same. I get the impression you liked it just a little bit more than me, but it was fun to watch. I was pleasantly surprised that this 30-year-old film from Australia managed to connect with me today. Um, ultimately, I don't think it's a significant film, except that it's the first of yeah. the Boz Lerman films. Yeah, and also uh, there are a couple of scenes that I really like uh, and I actually, I would say that they are like just connecting with the rest of the other films of the trilogy. That is like, when they are dancing in front of the Coca-Cola sign. I love that scene, that they are dancing in front oh, of the Coca-Cola yeah, yeah. sign. Mm-hmm. Like, you got it. And it's like there is always a Coca-Cola-like sign in each one of the movies, did you realize? Oh, interesting. I didn't yeah. pay attention. Yeah, in the second one, is also like a white horse, you know, in a diagonal and red. You know the background, and uh, on the third one is actually the Lamour one that is in red in yep. front of the building. And then Moulin Rouge. Come on, Rouge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, should we go over the questions? As we have like three movies to cover, and it looks like we are more or less in agreement. It doesn't look like a very deep movie for just saying what else. Yeah, we can definitely do it now, or we can do all three. Oh, you films. want to do it like a whole it's thing? It's up to you. Uh, I mean, I was thinking about it scoring like separately. All right. Yeah. So, pulling up the questions. Thank you for holding my mic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Strictly Ballroom. Jose, would you watch this again? I don't think that it would go out of my way for watching it again, but if he's playing on the TV, so they're like way, way worse L things to watch again. So I'm going to write down no for you because I, I feel like the spirit of this question <laughs> is would you ever like be with oh, yes, go out on a way. date and be like, hey, let's sit down and watch this film? I think that's, you know, something that I was thinking about is like, tell me three more movies that they're about dancing. Because I can think about Climax and uh, uh, crap, like the uh, Luca Guadagnino remake from the Dario Argento, Suspiria. Said, those Suspiria? Sh- yeah. Climax? Yeah, that's the that Save say. the Last Dance? I don't know. Bring it on? Uh, Isn't that about cheerleading? Yes, but they're dancers. <laughs> okay. They're serious dancers, too. Uh, the Las Vegas one that we love, Showgirls? <laughs> From Paul Verhoeven to uh, okay. Save the Last Dance two. Yeah. <laughs> Step <laughs> up. <it> on <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. From that perspective, it's true. It's like I don't know exactly on what circumstances I would say. Say, like, you know what? We're going to be watching Strictly Ballroom. Unless I'm saying that it's like, oh, you love Romeo plus Juliet and you love Molly and <laughs> Bruce. Is that like, let's watch? Fuck you, man. These- let's watch this because you're missing the highlights. So I'm the one taking down the answer. Is I, I'm putting no for you. It's not that you'll refuse to watch it. You're not going to okay, seek right, this out. I'm not going to go out of my way. That's fair. What about you? Uh, I would not watch this film again. Again, I had a nice time. There's nothing there for me, but I can see the the sort of person that likes very campy humor, original campy humor. It's yeah. there's a lot there for you. Yeah. Um. So, would you recommend this? I don't know to whom, you know, it's like if we actually were to call this Ali, as you say, like someone that loves like campy humor, you know, and he's like, oh, I love like Muriel's wedding and wonder if there is anything else from Australia on this sense. He's like, this, just watch this. He's like, I'm very, you know, it's like, I wouldn't go out of my way to recommend it to my parents, but I think that my parents could enjoy it. All right, that's fair. I wouldn't recommend this, not because I didn't like it per se, but just because it's never going to be like 
on the top of my head when yeah. somebody's like, hey, recommend me a good movie. This is not <laughs> in the top ten. But it's not a bad movie. It's not a bad movie, yeah. no. So will you remember this? No. Yeah, no. I'm not going to remember any of the details. Nope. Nope. He said the only thing that I would remember is that that woman is not from a Spanish-speaking country. <laughs> she should never try to speak in Spanish. I I think I will remember when the, the mother is giving the mockumentary interview, and you can't tell that she's, like, upset about what she's speaking about, and she's like, he's my only son. Like, yep. I was like, okay, that's funny. That's yep. actually funny. No, the, the first part I actually like it when they actually she's like, and then... <laughs> I did it. Those flare moves and the moves are like just mo the most ridiculous things that you can imagine. Like just always like just spinning and jumping. That is like it makes it even more ridiculous. Yeah, I agree. Um, is there anything artistic about it? I would say yes. I would say that from an artistic perspective, is that he, as we said, is that he understands like visual language, you know. And is that the scene? I think that the scene when they're like dancing in front of the uh, Coca-Cola sign and the camera goes down, that it almost feels like a Wes Anderson scene, but it's outdoors and it feels real. Is that that is scene? I find is like that's super cute, you know, like super sweet. I think you called it out earlier. You said he has a very strong visual language and sense of humor, which yeah. to me those are both very artistic things. So yeah. I would agree. Yeah, there's yeah. you. Can can immediately tell this is a director with a point of view you might not like that point of view or not find value in it yeah. but it's there yeah it may not be like the deepest point of view that you're ever going to see but yeah. it's there it's no shameless what what's the russian movie dang it i wanted to make a joke loveless loveless yeah <laughs> yeah there is there is a point there <laughs> there, is, there is a strong visual language but there is no comedy that's for sure is this a timeless piece oh i would say I don't know, man. That's a, that's a hard question for this one. I'll answer then. I think yes. I mean, this film is almost 30 years old. It still felt fresh in terms of the direction. Um, there's nothing that like firmly roots it into technology at the time. This mockumentary style, he did it well for the first half until he gave it up. Yeah, he gave it up after 15 minutes. That's the part is like, okay, you know that this is a trend that is started in cinema. And he's like, you just drop it. I wonder if they would actually, if they were to remake this movie, I would be curious to see it as a full commentary. So are you saying no? I'm saying no. I'm going to go with no. Interesting. Then we disagree on that. Uh, I mean, it's fine. I understand your point. But it's like, for me, is that there is something that is like, this is a 30-year-old movie. I cannot deny that it's a 30-year-old I just think that everything I got out of it in 2021, I would get out of it in 2041. Like, I don't feel like it's going to lose anything in those okay. 20 years. Do you so. think that in 1992, you have called us something different? You have been, like, the favorite I mean, I was like, eight. eight years so. old movie. <laughs> I, I think so, yeah. I don't think it would have felt any different, assuming I wasn't a child then, than it is today. That's fair. Uh, would you turn it into a TV nope. show? Absolutely not. Nope. It's like 90 minutes was, like, the perfect duration for this. Yes, I'm really glad it wasn't longer because it didn't wear out its welcome at all, but it could have. Yeah. And then, do you think this could be better? Yes, I, as I was mentioning a moment ago, I'd be curious to actually, for him to commit to the documentary format, I think that it would have been hilarious. I agree, and I think that, well, it's a Go ahead. Sorry, no, I was going to say this, but the problem is that the documentary style wouldn't fit well with his style of just being over the top and just being like, okay, the camera is here and I'm going to be like using the sparkles. That is almost like just fake. Is that he embraces the fakeness of cinema, you know, and he actually tries to thrive with it. Is that that don't think that that plays well with that? So I think that it could be better, but it would be a completely different movie. I would agree. I, I think there are things that could have made it better. I... I Without knowing specifically this was his first film, I felt like this feels like a film for somebody who's just graduated <laughs> film school and yeah. and is good, yeah. but it's the first film. What, but it was his first film. Yeah, but I'm just saying, like, you probably shouldn't feel that if... Mm. I have to say that it's like, for being a first film, is decent. You know, it's like it does, for me, it doesn't feel like just a fresh grad. You know, like fresh grad is like the Peter Jackson bad taste. Is a task that like he actually sold some stuff and he was able to actually record something. Or Clerks from Kevin Smith is like yeah, we're doing it like with close to zero budget, and I have 
no idea what I'm doing is going to work or not. I think that this guy knew that this was going to work. That's a very good, like, analogous film is Clerks. Like, yep. no budget, but nope. clearly, like, finely developed sense of humor and visual style. Yeah. Do you like Clerks, actually? I don't, but I I can oh. appreciate it. Okay. But I, that type of humor is just not my okay. not my cup of tea. Uh, I guess so. So, uh, scoring this. So at the beginning of this, I actually said that I was not going to be like sending my scores at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be like sending it. I'm going to be like bumping it to a six. From the perspective that I initially was going to be like lower than this, but it's like, honestly, when I think about it, I had a good time watching it. It's like, I'm going to remember it's like, no, but if I ever, like, sit down and it's like playing on the TV, it's like, maybe I will just watch it again. It's going to be, like, sunny, it's going to be silly, it's going to be, like, just random, but it's enjoyable. It's like more than L was last week. So when when Jose said that score, I raised my eyebrow because I thought there's no way I was going to score this higher than you, and I have. I scored it a six point five. It was already in the wow. spreadsheet. Wow. Okay. Um, and I know I say this every podcast, but like a five is perfectly mediocre. Yep. This is a few steps above mediocre. It's not good, which is seven point five. <laughs> <laughs> but it's there were some fun things about I, it. I think that I told you this, but it's like usually we have like a how do you say like an uh, a denomination for different scores in Spanish. So five is uh, aprobado, that is that you are approved. Is that you are approved for whatever you are doing. A six is actually is that it's good. It's good. It's a slightly above, you know, like what it is. Then seven and eight is notable. Okay. You know. Yeah. And it's like nine and ten is like uh, they call it sobresaliente. I don't know. It's like above. Exceptional. Exceptional. Yeah, yeah. yeah exceptional. So that's why I remind everyone, like, this is how I'm scoring. <laughs> five is the movie that you will never remember. 7.5, good. Oh, so seven is still like, eh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. No, that's fair. That's fair. For me, it's like, this is good. You know, it's a solid good. And I would agree with that. I think yeah. our scores are different, but essentially we agree. Yeah. Okay, right, so second one, Romeo plus Juliet, as this is like a three movie endeavor, I guess that I guess sorry, should summarize this. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, Shakespeare, Romeo plus Juliet, done, bam, <laughs> this one. <laughs> uh, no, but basically, it's the story of uh, the Montesco and the Capulets. The movie starts, this is probably the only movie that I ever was that it starts with a trailer of, it, the own, of its own movie. It's a news broadcast. It's a news broadcast, yeah. but actually they just display like a scenes that they're going to be like happening during the movie. Which is I, cool. I, it's cool, but it's like, it's like I just sort of thought, like, hey, am I watching like a trailer for the movie or is like the movie itself, you know? It's cool. It's an interesting like artistic exercise and I think that the movie is full of those, you know, about like just trying to pass a, push a bit, you know, not really pushing the boundary, but a bit more of a... Can I get away with this? Is this going to work or is this going to be like super tacky? And I, uh, I think that well, I'm not going to go into that and summarize it. So basically, the story of the Montes- Montesco, Montagues, Montagues, yeah, Montagues and uh, Capulets, mm-hmm. and uh, how Romeo, that is from the Montagues, falls in love with Juliet, that is the only daughter of the Capulets. So they fall in love without knowing who they are, and uh, they get married the following day. Basically, because they are really, really, really in love. Let's also remember that they're 15. Yeah, and actually the actress is 17. Well, oh. yeah, well, Leonardo DiCaprio is 22 or 23. Is a... So before you keep going, I do want to call out that this is the exact dialogue oh, from yeah. William Shakespeare's yep. play, but in a hyper modern, like, yep. yeah. Yeah, it's almost like a. Did you used to watch uh, Futurama? Yeah, yeah. You know that they make jokes about like LA being a, a post apocalyptic place. Is that it feels like that? It feels like okay, this is like a beach area. It's like it's Verona, but it's not Verona because Verona doesn't have a, a beach, mm-hmm. and it's like everything feels like a, what the '90s could think that a very dystopian world would look like. It's still like the '90s. Everything is the '90s, you know, but it feels like just driven by guns and the lies. Everything super colorful and also at the same time like. A bit dilapidated. It felt a little bit like Rio, in my opinion, oh, where like the right. wealth gap is so intense. So yep. like when they're hanging out in downtown Verona, it's like super grungy and dirty. And um, but of course, at the the homes of the rich families, it's very luxurious. Yep. Um, 
So anyway. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things that I always find hilarious. I, this is the second time that I watched this movie. And uh, I find hilarious that uh, they mention about daggers, swords, long swords. And it's like, depending on the size of the uh, of the weapon, of the physical weapon, of the white weapon, is that they use like different guns. And they actually, the camera shows, it's like, hey, this is a gun, a small gun, this is a dagger. If it's a sword, it actually says like sword on the side. You and know? then long sword. No, sorry, yeah, like yeah. The, uh, the automatic. I think that is like the it's like a, the capulets when they're like at the beginning of the movie. It's like, oh, I'm going to be like getting my long sword. And it's like, no, 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 no don't do it. So they do a lot of that like really clever yeah. visual explan not explanation, visual translation of the word of yeah. Shakespeare's words, yeah. which it's is like cool. just trying to say about like look. We both know, you know, like the audience and us, we know that what we're doing here doesn't make sense. It's crazy. It's just, I can't just take it like the word by word, like what, from the 16th century or late 15th? Yeah. I don't know, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're talking like the word by word, the same dialogue. And someone told me that this is probably the most accurate uh, translation to cinema from the perspective of the dialogue. The dialogue yeah, is I a, would agree with that. Yeah, is that there hasn't been like any other adaptation that hasn't adapted anything. So this is like almost word by word what it was like the original play. Did you see the Ethan Hawke adaptation of Hamlet? No, they did the same the, thing, like completely kept the old, the original dialogue, but it takes place now in like oh. a rich business kind of world. So it just obviously reminds me of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, that's cool because I was wondering if someone else did something like this, because the, this for me is a crazy experiment. It's like how a studio, I don't know if it was 20th Century Fox, that is like, hey, you only did a strictly bad rule, you know what it would work, like just giving you like this amount of money and see what happens, <laughs> you know, and what happens is, it's crazy, it's, it's completely crazy, it's like we usually just discuss, is that everything happens as you expect, is that they meet up in the party, you know, then they actually get a split, they through the nurse, they actually just talk with each other, and uh, they get married like 24 hours later. And then they have to just pull apart because uh, the cousin of Juliet kills Mercutio, that is Harold. Which I had completely forgotten about from the actual play. Oh, I good. can't believe yeah, I, did. Yeah, I forgot yeah, I that. I remember that. Is it uh, Harold Perino? I think that it is. And uh, then Romeo just forgets. He's like, no, we don't want to be violent. It's like, and he actually goes into a rampage and <laughs> kills the cousin. And uh, then he has to run away. And then we know like the tragedy that is like the, where the star cross the Lover's expression comes from that is a they just basically commit suicide. Model that. Well, I mean, Julia doesn't commit suicide. Well, she does. She, does she, she wasn't the plan, though. Yeah. 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 But it's like, I have to say only the only thing that I want to say about this is that I fucking hate that last scene when Romeo goes to see like Juliet that is supposed to be dead and it's like Juliet is starting to just waking up and he's like come on I remember this from the last time that I watched it I fucking hate that you're like just toying with my emotions we all know what is going to happen but that's what Shakespeare did I mean it's not Baz Luhrmann's fault this is Shakespeare's fault True, it's more theatrical this way. Yeah, you know, it's like oh, these fifteen-year-old kids got secret married, had sex, and now they're killing themselves. Yeah, that's true. That's what you get. <laughs> <laughs> so I will say that um, visually, we mentioned we liked what was happening in Strictly Ballroom, but like I think this is, and again, this is a second film, and he had money. But visually, holy shit, this yeah. film is impressive. Yeah. Like, super impressive. Yeah. And it doesn't feel dated at all, at least to me. Well, for me, it feels like a video clip from uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. That's true, but like, if you think about where Mercutio was like, oh, his body beats. was. No, 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 with the, in the church with the neon light crosses. Oh, where well, Juliet, no Mercutio. Well, he laid there first, and then when she, they thought she was dead, they took her there. There's like two or three separate scenes in that, in that church. Yeah. I just like that visual. It's, it does feel very 90s, but it still feels so fresh. No, no, it feels like just well made. It's a bit more. It's like this guy was not like just being derivative. It's like he understood 
what the nineties were about. Yeah, it's yeah, like he, he was, did. He was not about like he could have made like this movie instead of being like Romeo plus Juliet, Romeo and Persan Juliet, and just setting up in the forties. You know, and I, I, I would have watched that movie too. I was like, yep. I would love to watch that kind of stuff. You know, so just do this exercise. I think the best way that you know, like some bands, like a uh, Wizard, for example, the Wizard used to do like the call color albums. Yep. Uh, every seven years, they would have like a new one. I said, okay, we're like just doing like a pop exercise, just thinking about like what is the cool thing right now. I think that it would be cool to see an exercise of a Bas Lorman saying that I'm going to be remaking Romeo Plus Judith in a different decade. Every decade. Every the decade. 80s, well, yeah, 70s. Yeah, it's like not only about like current decades, but it's like I'm going to be like going back and just doing like something that aesthetically is impressive and it actually just fits into the reality of that moment. I have to say that I was genuinely impressed with this film. I got tired of the dialogue just because yep. it's so esoteric. Like, yep. um, but I appreciated like the actors clearly had spent time studying the script. The visuals were incredible. Um, the, the there's a there's a, it's not a set. I don't know where there's this like dilapidated. The theater, theater the on a beach yeah. with the wall that's fallen down yeah, and like it's incredible. all so cinematic and so stunning and I know you don't like Claire Danes but I feel like the acting overall was was great it was it was good for me it was good I think that is I look when you're giving like a this situation it's hard to actually excel and I think that is like they did a good job and making Mercutio black okay. but not just black a straight black man who does drag and like performs like it's yeah. just also created it's yeah. so creative yeah no i think that the mercus is my favorite character from the perspective is like that he can actually just bring that kind of life he felt engaging you know that both of the cousins i was like just tired every single time that they were on the screen both of them like the prince of cats john leguizamo i was like Ugh. it's like such a one note kind of character but it's like mercus i agree with you that is like this is a well active character. I also very much enjoyed Juliet's mother, who plays like a, a like a debutante, like a socialite, but that has a drug issue and over relies on her daughter. Like there were just so many interesting choice character choices, visual choices. Um, I do feel I thought a lot about Tom Tequer and oh. Run Lola Run. Because okay. there are moments where it gets very frenetic, but frenetic in the '90s style. Yep. That like the the first conflict between the Capulets and the Montagues happens at a gas station, and it just, just it speeds up and then it slows down. Yeah. And it's, everyone's like freaking yeah, out over the yeah, top it's like and just throwing you off. You know. Really, yeah. You know, like he knows what he's doing. It's, like, it's funny because I was thinking, it's like, okay, who else uses? Like fast forward, you know, like just speeding up the scene. Well, no one. Tony Scott, I would argue, does did. He's okay. dead now, but oh, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Like, did you see Domino or uh, Man the the Denzel Washington one, Man on Fire? I don't think so. Domino thing that I may have watched it, but uh, in slow motion, there are like many directors like Zack Snyder that have use of that the crap out of that. Is like this is dramatic, so I'm going to be using the crap out of this, and he. Bas Norman also abuses out of this, but is that just combining like both things in the same movie and just knowing when to use them? I felt it's like, okay, you know the basics of this. You're not using it in a very sophisticated way, but it's like it's hard to use fast camera. But also, let's remember this is his second film, his That's second, yep. and I think for a sophomore film to undertake this project in a different country with this much money, this experimental. I, I was honestly kind of in awe. I don't think this is like a 10. I really don't. But for a second film, yeah. good for you, boss. Yeah. I mean, that's what you. I said. Is that I think it is like an impressive experiment. If it's an experiment that needed to be done, that's a different Maybe question. not. <laughs> Maybe not. Because I, I, for me, it was as a Strictly Barroom was so enjoyable, this wasn't. This wasn't. It's like all the dialogue for me was like just uphill. Like, oh my God. It's like you have to just focus. This almost like just watching The Wire. The Wire in Russia. That's true. Like, this one felt a little bit more like work, but I also felt like it was more emotionally rewarding. Okay. Well, because she said Shakespeare play. And there's drama, and there there was very little drama in, in Strictly Ballroom. Yeah, it's very safe. Strictly Ballroom is like just plays like a like a soft listen kind of song. And this a bit more is that look, this is the kind of basics of what is love about. Listen. And then kind of like 
I don't feel like Strictly Ballroom really used music too much. I mean, they used ballroom music. They used the the Spanish dance music to like yeah. set moods. But I feel like Romeo plus Juliet is right in between Strictly Ballroom oh, yeah. and Moulin Rouge, and oh, yeah. you could see how inspired he was of music. Um, and then at the Montague's party. There's a scene where a woman sings this ballad that's so impactful, and it reminded me so much of um, the David Lynch film that we love so much. What about it? Mulholland Drive? Mulholland, Mulholland Drive. Drive. You remember oh, that the scene? The theater of yeah, the silence? It, because it was like, all of a sudden, everything was so frenetic and busy, and all of a sudden, everything slows down, and there's this oh, yeah, beautiful vocalist. Nice. And yeah. I was very touched by that scene. Um, and you know I'm biased when it comes to Radiohead, but the use of Radiohead songs in this... Oh, did they use it more than at the end? Is like I only realized I almost wrote it when I was in the credits. It's like, wait, Radiohead wasn't this? What they else? did exit music for a film at the during the credits, and then there was another one. I think it may have been the same song, but there was another Radiohead where I was like... <gasps> and I got super excited. So not completely biased. Okay. And I, I just feel like the way he allows film to influence or sorry music to influence his film i enjoy very much and i admire the fact that it was a little bit overbearing but he used it as like a tool to kind of explain the dialogue like hey you might not understand the five phrases that were just uttered here's a little bit of music to explain that this is dramatic or this is a moment of love or uh, sure but it's, like, it's the kind of thing that is a look you are like just you're handicapping yourself. You're handicapping your storytelling. But I feel like he was handicapped by the script, and he used the music to kind of help true, overcome true. that 500 year difference. But that's the reason why I say that this is an experiment. But if it's an experiment that is enjoyable to watch, I have my doubts. So would you say that you enjoyed watching it or not? I was okay watching it, but it's like if we weren't watching, I mean, it's like what I was expecting when you said, okay, let's watch you, I was expecting you to actually say, like, a strictly about Roma Mola and Rose. Wow. Yeah. Haven't we joked in our friendship about how much I like Romeo plus Juliet? I know you do. Okay. And we already, like, I already said it. It's like, I don't, I mean, I say this sentence about, like, I don't know if this is a movie that needed to be done, but it's good that it was done. But aren't you happier that there's a world where this movie exists? As a gateway to Malin Rouge, maybe. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Honestly, it's like I I don't dislike it, but it's like for me this this one felt like work. Honestly, it, and it is work. It's a Shakespeare play. Yeah, yeah, yep. and, and he expects you to, as we already mentioned, turn Mercutio into a cross-dressing black man and that sings, and yep. it's yep. No, and that part is amazing, honestly. But it's like everything else is like, oh my God, is it just Romeo? Shut up! Just fucking shut up! <laughs> yeah, there are there are some monologues where I'm like. Yeah. Okay, I mean, maybe yeah. cut this down, man. Yeah, there is no point. Said, yeah, I know that you were adopting a Shakespeare, but I said there is no reason for doing this for 10 minutes. So, are we ready for the questions? We are ready we for are. the questions. Okay. Yeah. Jose, <laughs> would, would you watch this again? No. This is openly no. Because I told you, it feels like work. But the best films require work. Loveless requires work, but the emotional payoff is incredible. No, but Loveless actually is like I know where it's going. It's like I know that it's going to be like just wrenching my heart, but it's not about like oh my god, every single word that I'm reading, I have to just focus into okay, what does this mean in all English? You know? You did you you didn't watch it with Spanish subtitles? No, it was with English subtitles. Oh god, yeah. I can't even imagine that. I tried to read Dostoevsky in Old Russian. I was like, fuck you, no. So did you watch it again? 100%. Uh, it is work, um, but visually, it's worth it. It's it's a very interesting film to me in what he tried to do. Oh, yeah. Maybe he didn't succeed, but yep. I will always be open into watching interesting yeah. films. Yeah, yeah. It's what we say also about, like, Bakurao, that we say it's, like, design experiment. If it's a or so not, it's a different question, but it's, it's both. Yeah. So, would you recommend it? No. <laughs> One more time with a little more confidence. No. No. No, I mean, from the perspective, it's like if I feel like it's work, it's like, we're going to be recommending it to this. It's like, if someone asks me, it's like, what is the best, and you're going to want to punch me for this, so I'm happy that you're holding your phone and your microphone. If someone asks me, like, what is the best from your plus Juliet movie, I would say, Shakespeare in Love. 
I'm glad you're moving to Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> no, I respect that. Um, I get it. I mean, it's a bit more is that there are like so many adaptations of Romeo and Juliet. There is a guy, and we all know the story. There is no surprise, there is no turn or anything. It's like the only thing is like Harold Perry, no, as Mercutio. That's the only thing that is like, wow, this is pretty random and it's cool. So I, I also would not recommend it, but only because I can't think of a single person in my life that would be interested. If I met some like weird introverted nerd at a bar one night, I'd probably... But maybe they already watch it. They already watched yeah, it I mean, several like, times. They are like just weird introverted nerds in a bar. <laughs> <laughs> Who spent their teenage years watching these weird experimental gay films. Mm -hmm. Not that this is a gay film, but there's a lot gay about it. Oh, yeah. Um, would you remember it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I remember like most of it. Yeah, I was trying to think of the last time I saw this film. I've seen it. I think two or three times, but it has to have been at least 15 years, and I remembered a lot about it. Um, I said I, yeah, that blew my mind. I was like, have I really forgotten this much about Romeo plus Juliet? Um, so is there anything artistic about it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. It's, it's only like strictly about Romeo. It's like this guy has a visual language that is amazing, and it's like he knows how to use them. It's like he's bold. He's bold. On what he's Super doing. bold, and I think that his tastes have stood the test of time. Like yeah. again, twenty five years later, I was still like, wow, this is yeah. this is insane. And that's the thing that I guess only for this maybe more. Is that now I watch all of his movies, and I think that Australia and the Great Federal they are the least interesting ones of all of them. You it's said like, Australia and the Great Gatsby? The Great Gatsby, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fitzgerald is the... John Fitzgerald is the, the alpha. I knew what you meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. Uh, I feel like they are the least interesting one. He actually tried to do like a similar thing to the Great Gatsby. He didn't adapt it to nowadays, but he actually took the original book. And he's like, it's true that it's easier. When was this written? In the 30s? 20s or 30s? Yeah, because it was like the dry... I love. So it's like he took the story and he set it up on that time and he made his sparkles kind of thing. And it's like I think that is like, yeah, this is less interesting than if you were like to just do Romeo plus Juliet and you set it up in Verona in the 15th century. He said that wouldn't have been interesting at all. And now that we're talking more in context of like the three movies, this is why I thought of Steve McQueen is because I agree Australia was not good. The Great Gatsby was tolerable, but his most interesting films were early on. And yep. that's how I feel about Steve McQueen. That's true. That's true. And yeah, they don't have like too many more films. No, they both, I think, have five. Only five? There's Steve Hunger, McQueen? Shame. Yeah. Uh, 12 Years a Slave. Uh, Widows. Widows. Oh, um, so just four. It's only four. It's like right. Steve McQueen is even like less prolific. But he has been active less time. That Bas Luhrmann. Bas Luhrmann for just being active for 30 freaking years. And only 30 having five years. Films. Yeah, he only has five films. It's crazy. He does have an untitled Elvis Presley project yeah, <laughs> coming out next year. Let's see how that goes. And I remember reading something about that. I, that was the film Tom Hanks was working on in Australia when he got COVID. I, I'd have to look that up, but I'm pretty oh, sure no, I remember right, that. Right. Yeah, it was yeah. a film Elvis thing. Yeah. Is it a timeless piece? Uh, it's just a no. This is like so freaking hard to actually answer from the perspective that is a I love and I think that I brought you about this. I find hilarious the joke when they say when they show like the uh, security guards when he falls into the uh, swimming the pool, pool yeah. and they are like reading the not the time the timely. <laughs> Do you know, <laughs> we were like, yeah, I'm doing this because I want to just anchor this story in the 90s. I want to just take like this timeless story and just put it in a specific decade. And uh, yeah, this is a complicated question to answer because the words are 500 years old. The yeah. style is very 90s, but I would say that this is a timeless piece. Like this is going to be as interesting in 30 years as it was to, yeah. to us. No, for the last perspective, few days. from that perspective, yeah, I agree with you. That is, like, is what it is. Yeah. Would you turn it into a TV show? Nope. Yeah, absolutely not. I, I mean, this yeah. was long enough. Yeah, two hours. Yeah, two hours. Um, and do you think this movie could have been better? Honestly, I'm not completely sure. IDK? Is that what you want? IDK? 
Heideke, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, just go with Heideke. I think that it's like a... I don't know what could have changed here. Yeah, to be honest, whether or not this experiment was a success, I wouldn't change a thing about it. Like, yep. let's, let's just let this be a relic of 1995, and it's like a time capsule of, yep. like, Shakespeare and Baz Luhrmann and the 90s and the filmmaking in the 90s. Yep. So I would say no. Yep. Okay, so now I'm super curious about your score. Okay, I'm, I'm going to... I, I have been like just bumping everything, you know? It's like my score was going to be like lower, but my score is going to be a 7. Because I think that it's super fucking bold that this happened. <laughs> this is still like something that like, when I think about it, when I was watching, like, who the fuck trusts this guy? After just watching a Strictly Maroon, he's like, who trusts this guy for sort of doing this? That With like, like a like, large theater. budget. Yeah, like a large budget and doing something so wrong that like, who is going to fucking enjoy this? And there was a lot of top talent from the 90s. Like, not, maybe not top talent, but like yeah. A-list yeah. celebrities. Yeah. Claire Danes like was up. huge then. Leonardo DiCaprio had just blown up. And there's a ton of character actors. How did he actually blow up before this? Because I thought that this was the first movie that I saw from him that is, like, oh yeah, he's Leonardo DiCaprio. He's from Romeo and Juliet. Maybe this, maybe this is the film that blew him up. I could yeah. be mistaken. When was The Beach? <laughs> that was after this. Damn it. All right. That was definitely after this. But he definitely had already become a big deal from that sitcom he was on with oh, the Seavers. Family Matters? Yeah. Uh, well, it's no, not it's, Family Matters, it's but it's the, one the of those. The other one. Like, yes. These are white. Yeah, yeah white family. <laughs> white family. <laughs> with Kirk Cameron. That's the one. Yep. yep. So my score is a 7.5. This one doesn't surprise me at all that I liked it more than you. Um, I Again, according to my own rating scale, this is a good film. Yep. It's not great. It's good. <laughs> so I'm happy you actually scored it that high. I didn't expect it. and Well, because I told you that this is not a movie that I would ever watch again deliberately, but it's, I still think that cinema benefits from having this movie. You asked me this earlier. It's like, yeah. you think that it's better? It's like, it is. Because it's like, who the fuck is going to be like doing this with this budget? It's like, this is a remnant of a different time when Hollywood was willing to experiment with a star that is like, this makes no sense. This movie could not have existed, or would not be made today. It wouldn't. But it would have made in any other time, either. Just think, is that, do you think that in the 50s or 60s they would have done that? Adapting? No, they would actually have used like the large sets, Hollywood, Golden Age, aesthetic. And now that you mentioned the Ethan Hawke Hamlet was also in the 90s, with like Glenn Close. That was the time it the was world like, yeah. was open to this. Yep, yep. It's only like we were discussing about like Fight Club. It's like Hollywood was not afraid of experimenting in the 90s. Yeah. And it's like, it just went away. It's like, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, and Butler Man did the most out of it. And from that perspective, it's like, bravo. That's amazing. Good for you. So you gave Strictly Ballroom a six, this a seven. Yep. And now. Now. The gayest what? movie of all time. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but what about if we take like a small break? Yeah, let's do that. All right. So, uh, yeah, we will be back in a second. So we are back after a small break. And we are going to discuss the final of the three films we watched yep. by oh, Baz Luhrmann. The Red Curtain Trilogy. I still, do you find any satisfactory explanation why this is a trilogy? I mean, so I haven't thought about the answer to that question, but I definitely feel like these three films are cl more closely connected than Australia and The Great Gatsby. You can see the progression of the importance of, of music, the campiness. He yep. doesn't do any camp with the other two movies at all. Huh. No, Australia, I remember they had like a bit of camp at the beginning. A bit, it's a bit more like adventure, like action adventure camp, like Indiana Jones. But there is a bit of it at the beginning, and then it turns like more serious. And then yeah, it it's like more a of a drama. Yeah. And you can see his evolution, even in these three films, from like pure camp to camp with drama to Moulin Rouge, which is basically camp with love and tragedy. <laughs> yeah. 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 He likes the melodrama. I would say that it's a bit more like melodramatic, all of the movies. Yeah. You know? Because also the relationship of the uh, of Fran with her uh, family is also a melodrama. About like, just being trapped in something that is not bringing her happiness. So I guess I describe what this movie is about. Yes, you do. Um, okay, so Satine 
is the star of the show. Her, uh, she's played by Nicole Kidman. She's the star courtesan at Moulin Rouge, a mm-hmm. brothel in Paris. In the, I'm guessing it's around the turn of the century. It's, yeah, 1891, yeah. 99. Um, and the film starts out with Ewan McGregor, who is a penniless writer, writing about the death of his beloved Satine. He's so dreamy. He's so dreamy. Freaking dreamy. Yeah. Um. So we find out the end of the film in the opening... I think it's the opening scene. Yep. Um, and then it goes into the story of how they got there. And so it turns out that... Satine is meant to be married off to a duke who wants, obviously, to fuck her. And she wants to stop being a prostitute and become a real actress. Yep. But unfortunately, right at this time, she meets Ewan McGregor and falls in love with him in an instant, much like Romeo plus Juliet. Yep. It's basically the span of one song. Sure, but it's at least one song. Is that they actually fall in love in the bathroom. They do. <laughs> yeah. They do. And um, I don't even know how to describe this. There's almost like no plot here. So there is there is like it's a bit of a meta kind of movie is that they are like just portraying they're like just building a play and at the same time it's like the play is happening in real life so they find out a way to keep Ewan McGregor around because he's going to be the playwright for the play that they're asking the Duke to invest in um, so basically Ewan McGregor is writing I can't remember the name of his character uh, Christian. he's basically writing their love story happening yeah. in real time yep. into the play so that they can continue to have secret coded messages and sing songs to each other. It doesn't sound like a bit like country. It does <laughs> without the vision. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing that is like he's country always goes like a bit more. I don't know if sophisticated is the word, but I was deeper. Deeper, maybe you know he he goes a bit more like homemade. You know, yeah. You know, like a bit more like this. Is that this is the kind of stuff that you could do with a lot of fantasy and a lot of spare time at your house? And he's like, no, Molin Rouge is like just going crazy, like large sets and everything. And there, yeah, there's nothing homemade about this. There are songs that had to cost millions in royalties. Songs by the Beatles, songs right. by like just Debbie Bowie, yeah, don't uh, think. Nirvana. Yep. I mean, uh, damn it, I can't think of the name. Um, I love this soundtrack. I love it. They had like seven of my Madonna too. Yeah, like a virgin like was exceptional. Yeah. yeah. So they keep stringing the Duke along, saying that they. They're just writing. And no, the writer's just writing, and she loves you, and she won't sleep with you right now because she feels like the first time you have sex, it's going to be like <laughs> her wedding night. So then they sing like a virgin, yeah. and there are several brilliant like musical numbers, dances. Oh, um, the Rosan one is still amazing. Uh, especially the response. portrayal of an Argentine. I felt like it was so realistic. Um, <laughs> I'm married to an Argentine. <laughs> in case anyone doesn't get it. Um, I actually watched this movie with my husband last night and every time they made some joke about him being Argentine, I was like, that's you! That's you! That's exactly you! Um, so ultimately, she has to make a choice between marrying off for love marrying the duke for money marrying the writer for love and they want to run away but then the basically the pimp of moulin rouge tells her you're dying of consumption and the duke wants to kill the writer so yep. you need to hurt him scare him away yep and then there's the opening night of the of the play spectacular the spectacular, spectacular. <laughs> and um of course she ends up with the writer in this very dramatic kind of finale which I'm not describing it very well, but it's super intense. Like, there's no way you can describe what happens, but it's it's very it's dramatic, really very over visually, the top. very yeah. over the top. She proclaims his love for the writer. The Duke fails in his attempt to murder uh, the writer, and then in that same moment, she dies. Yep. 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 Is that she chose. Yep. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, I had to say that this is a visual orgy for your eyes. Is this? It's incredible. I remember like the first time that I watched it, I looked, this is like too much. It's almost like the uh, Fifth Element, the Luc Besson movie, that I felt is like, this is too much. You're going too crazy with the colors here. You know, but it's like the more that I watch it, it's like the more that I like it as a guilty pleasure. I don't think that it's a perfect movie by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a like visually is incredible. All the kind of homage, all the kind of small touches, it's like how he actually plays with them is incredible and the sunniness and the craziness and everything is like at some point I feel like this is pretty dumb but it's like he knows that it's pretty dumb 
I agree with you, and I think um, visually it's stunning, musically it's stunning, um, but he does fully commit to the camp, and yep. so I felt like there was a bit of departure from the first two films where the character is stopping asked to act like real human beings. And so there are many scenes where Nicole Kidman is just like writhing all over the floor and making funny noises and not like acting like a human being. That that, because of who I am, I'm not saying this is good or bad. I was like, oh yeah, this, this a, uh, for me it was like this is a play, you know, this is like a bit more of a theater play. It's like yeah. we know that these are not about like, just being human beings; they are like vehicles of a story, you know. And the story is about like just selling you true love. That's true. I would say for me the characters became characters and they weren't fully flushed out individuals in my opinion. Oh yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that, but I think that he was not trying to do that. You know, I think that it's a bit more of a. I want to start with a first, like a first scene that is like pretty dramatic. Then I want to start with a comedy. He's like, oh, I believe in love all over things. And like, but I've never been in love. Is like, that almost feels like the Winner Paltrow movie about like, I've never been kissed. No, that was Drew Barrymore. Oh, it's Drew Barrymore. That's true. It's not, <laughs> yeah. I know my bad 90s rom-coms. Okay, don't worry. Sorry. Yeah. But it's like, it's, it starts with that. And it's like he actually makes the transition. It's like, okay, now he comes the drama. I want... This is a metal drama. It's like he actually looks at the musicals. The Roseanne move. The Roseanne uh, number. I love it because it feels like a 40s and 50s musical. 100%. It does, and they fully commit to it. It's it's not like one foot in reality and one foot in camp. It's like one, both feet in oh, yeah. camp. Yeah. But I will, so that's not my scene, but I will say that in the emotional arc of this show, I got kicked in the gut at the very end. I knew it was coming, and I was super upset, and as stupidly cheesy as this seems, I was like, all I need is love. All I need is my husband. <laughs> <laughs> that's it uh, so I was a little bit ashamed because I went to bed so early last night that I woke up at 6am and I didn't have to work for 3 hours so I was like I'm going to finish Moulin Rouge before work okay and uh, and then I cried and texted my husband that I loved him Oh, <laughs> that's adorable so I, I I mentioned this to say that I didn't enjoy the characters becoming less fully evolved but he did that without sacrificing any of the emotional impact I would actually say that for me it's the other way around is that they start like characters and they start like being more full-fledged as the movie progresses. You know, they start at the beginning about like just sunny characters because they see when they're on the elephant and they're like just selling the duke like what the show is going to be is that that's like the sunniest thing that I ever saw in any movie. I don't disagree with you but there's a scene where the duke comes into the into Satine's room and Ewan McGregor is hiding there, and so she does this series of ridiculous, like, thrashing around on the floor and making funny noises, and I was like, this is... No, I, I, it's just too much for me. I, it was too much camp, um, but I do see what you say, and I, the only reason I was able to feel an emotional impact or punch to the gut was because I, I did believe in these characters, and I was invested in their journey. Yeah. Um, I do want to believe in love. I do want to believe in love, and I hate that about myself because I'm very pessimistic. Yeah. I don't like anybody or anything <laughs> except my husband and Jose. So. <laughs> okay, I was going to say that. I don't feel a bit offended. Uh, yeah, for me, it's like I usually don't like comedy. We discussed this a couple of podcasts ago, and it's like, this is a comedy. That is like, I don't know if there is any point that I laugh out loud. But I have a smile on my face for half of the movie. There were a couple of jokes, and unfortunately, they were by uh, John Lerona. I can never pronounce his name. Which annoyed me because I felt like he was the worst character. Like that scene where they like crawl up the elephant and it's not realistic at all. For some reason, that really ticked me off. I, I love that scene, but it's like it's once again because I love when cinema embraces its fakeness. You know, it's like that's the reason what I like with Sanderson is that like he's the, you know, like the perfect example of this. About like, I know that cinema is about entertainment, I know that the cinema is not about like just displaying reality. So, let me ask you, which film did you enjoy more, The Grand Budapest Hotel or The Royal Tenenbaums? Uh, the problem that I have with The Grand Budapest Hotel is that it's three hours. <laughs> <laughs> there is a man, there is a limit to actually, you know, like what you can do. For me, more Rice Kingdom, a uh, life aquatic, 
and then probably the Grand Budapest Hotel. You know, the Royal Tenenbaums, there are a couple of scenes that I find hilarious. You know, like when the servant, the man servant, like just stabs, like the father of the family, like I find that scene hilarious. So if we look at his body of work for, on a spectrum, where at one end is Bottle Rocket, and then like the Royal Tenenbaums, and all the way at the other end is Isle of Dogs and the Grand Budapest Hotel. Yeah. What I like to consume is, is definitely closer to the Royal Tenenbaums, um, so less sophisticated, less about like yeah, everything is about like the same. No, more about like the characters being real, fleshed out human beings. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. that's how I see it. Maybe yeah. that's not reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that this is a bit more of a characters are like just vehicles, and it's like you like it or hate it, but there's what they are. And I found it very interesting that this had as little character development as Romeo pl Romeo and yeah, Juliet it's the what play. Is what I was going to say. Yeah. Like, actually, it feels like it's a solid Romeo plus Juliet. Romeo plus Juliet is that the characters are just vehicles of Star Cross lovers. Yeah. They don't try to be like as perfect. They anything. don't develop like Romeo's past or his interest or his relationship nope. with his father. Yeah. Um, and that's why I enjoyed watching these three films in chronological order, because you could see him evolve. Just going towards the direction. And you could see like him experimenting and maybe not liking something he did in Romeo and Juliet, and liking something he did and amplifying it to Moulin Rouge. Yeah. And his like full embrace of music, which I think, besides Dancer in the Dark, this is probably my favorite use of music in a film. Yeah. Yeah. I don't disagree. It's like I'm still like impressed. There are a couple of songs that they just give me like the goosebumps. That is like when they actually start like just playing it, it's like I just start like just humming them. You know, it's like for example like the spectacular, spectacular when they open the act, like that Indian song. That is like, oh, she's God. Like, it's like wow, okay, that's amazing. Like the kind of build up that you have done to this point and how it actually plays out on the screen. And also, I felt like their play about the Maharaji and the young courtesan could have been super racist, and it wasn't no. in the slightest. They used genuine Indian music. He was super respectful, and I thought he's a little bit of a visionary in like respecting the the work of other artists, respecting all like Nirvana. Yep. Uh, like nothing sound, nothing sound like just I'm mocking this. I mean, yeah. there were a couple of songs that I was like, okay, probably they didn't have this in mind when they created it, but it's still. He used the work of others to enhance his work, and I yep. feel like that's all he did was enhance his visual language, his visual style. Um, I was very impressed, very impressed. I, I, when is the last time you watched Moulin Rouge? For me, it was like probably like five or six years ago. I mean, I used to watch it when I was in college. Like, every single time that I was drunk. That is like, okay, I can acknowledge to myself <laughs> that I like this now that I'm drunk. But for a very long time, I was like, this is bullshit. And I got to a point, it was almost like just coming to terms that you are gay. Is that it was almost like the same thing for coming to terms that I do like Marlin Rouge. I don't think you've ever said that to me. <laughs> I, I can tell you that. I think that is like when I realized is I probably, just after I finished college, and I had like a CD or a DVD, you know, with a movie, and I fell asleep watching it like completely drunk and he played like three times in a loop so I woke up like multiple times during the night you know and, I was and you're just like moment. oh there's a nice scene exactly and like, <laughs> sleeping yeah I mean there's something inside me that wants to reject this film from one perspective well there's the camp that's a personal choice a personal taste but then there's also like an entire generation of people learned about a heart-shaped box by Nirvana from this film, and that upsets me to an extent, but I cannot be upset at the way Boz Lerman used this music. It's no. it's remarkable. Uh, if he actually achieved that some people knew about Nirvana, I think that it was like a novel goal. What is the name of the fucking Phil Collins band? The Police. The Police did Roxanne, right? It was probably... Yeah. Yeah, it's The Police. That's what I've been trying yeah. to think of this entire podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I definitely learned some... I was introduced to music that I hadn't been introduced to, and I was like... And I will say that every piece of music is good. He yeah. has good taste. In, yeah. I don't know if he was responsible for picking out all the music, but the guy clearly has taste. Oh, he yeah. can do whatever he wants. Yeah. Whether or not it's to my taste, it varies, but I will... Not taking into, into account Australia or... Uh, <laughs> I did like The Great Gatsby, but like... Yeah. The dude, the dude can make something impressive and and something that will get your attention. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, no, visually is something that I 
true that it's like Gondry or uh, Fincher or other directors that are like extremely heavy handers when it comes to the visual, they are amazing too. But this guy, it's like what he actually pulled with this, is like this is like a his sight. It's like he's you know like at the peak about like what you pulled here is that this works is like okay you made Romeo plus Juliet work that is like it's weird it's fucking weird but you made this work that is just uh, something that should make my eyes bleed and it's interesting because if you were to come up to me and be like are you a Baz Luhrmann fan the answer would be no which is interesting because if you ask me would you watch anything Baz Luhrmann puts out the answer is yes Yes. it doesn't matter (laughs) so I think I am a fan and there's some like cognitive dissonance that is like refuses to allow me to embrace because it doesn't doesn't feel elevated it It does not feel elevated it feels easy quote unquote but still even if I actually feel easy it's it's fucking hard to pull something like this or Romeo plus Juliet and the cohesion of each of the three films they're like entirely separate universes but they also make sense together it's it's crazy yeah yeah and i think that it's like i that's the reason what it was like when i went to watch australia was like just having such high hopes and i felt so like you're dead to me (laughs) and then when i went to watch the great gatsby it's like did you really need more than two hours for telling this he said no you did who was the the main female lead was it mia wasikowska i don't remember on the great gatsby i don't remember all right well overall I was genuinely impressed with my reaction to this film. I didn't. I thought it was going to feel like a guilty pleasure. It did not. It felt like this is a good movie. Yeah, but it's like, I don't know why do we feel like a guilty pleasure about this movie? Why? I think for the reasons I said, it's super campy. Campy is typically not okay. great, no, 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 no. and you and I both love music more than I would say the average person. Mm-hmm. So like the aberration of the way like like a heart-shaped box is used you're like this isn't supposed to be used in a love story in paris in the 1930s like yeah. but it works is that the it lyrics, does. He's a smart. he actually analyzed the lyrics and he actually says like actually this works is that they actually use one of my favorite uh, movies Gore- sorry songs goreki by lamb and they only sing like three sentences and they call Kidman. He's like, if I go die at this very moment. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's like, there are only like three sentences. And I was like, holy shit, I have forgotten this because it fits so well into this. Is like, he actually just analyzes, like, okay, what is cool on music right now? And it doesn't have to be mainstream. Because my mom, yeah, it's mainstream, but what? Lamb? Who remembers Lamb? Yeah, I would agree with you and say that, like, he used original songs from multiple genres, but none of it ever felt like it was a stretch. Like, oh, yep. he just wanted to use the, the song by the police. Like, it fit in so yep. well with the script. Yep. And I actually don't... Did he write that alone? No, yeah, it was a collaboration. I don't know exactly how they split. Do you know that the only song that is original to this is Come What May? Wow. Yeah, and Come What May didn't actually participate for the Oscars because it was originally written for Romeo plus Juliet, but they cut it at the end. Wow, I yep. had no idea. Yeah, I heard about it the other day. I knew that Conway May was like the only original one, and I like that song. It's like, I think that Nicole Kidman, and going on record here, I think that she's super talented when it comes to singing. So I think she's good, but in the singing, when you actually put her against Iwan McGregor, that's like he's classically trained and he used to do play like, musicals. He said, yeah, there's a difference. Don't you feel like there was a lot of auto-tune, like a lot of auto-tune? With Nicole Kidman, yeah. And with Iwan, no? Mm, with Iwan, there was a bit, but it's like with Nicole Kidman, there was like pretty clear. It's like they were like just, okay, we need like a higher pitch. Let's just, just, just go. Just raise it up. Raise it up, yeah. There's a tiny bit. Almost like with the keys on a strictly bar room when they go into the sound room and they try to just play with the controls. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I I don't know what more to say about this film, but I was impressed. And these are his first three films. And I saw personally a major progression between each one. Um And even when it wasn't to my style, I was like, okay, this isn't like my favorite film, but this is good. And it's more than, as we said, a guilty pleasure, but it's, it's even more than just entertainment. There's a lot of quality here. Yeah. No, I agree. So you open the questions? Yes, we should. So, Jose. Ask me. Ask me. (laughs) Hit me with your best question. Would you watch this again? Yes. 
Yes, I would definitely watch this again. It's like this is one of, I love musicals, and it's like this is one of my favorite ones. You do love musicals. I do. You do. I would absolutely watch it again, and I felt that way before watching it this time, but now that I actually watched it, I was like, yeah, I'm going to watch this movie again. It yep. may not be for like a year, but I'm going to watch this movie. Would you recommend it? Yes. Yeah, I would definitely recommend it. Is Would you remember it? Yes. I remember like most of it. Yeah, there was almost nothing I forgot. I forgot about the Duke wanting to kill him, like that little plot. Oh, no, I remember like the, at the end, like with the with the gang, I was like, no, this is mine, this is mine. And yeah. then he gets like punched and the gang like just flies into the blue. It was like, so aesthetically amazing, you know. It feels like some kind of a milieu homage in so many scenes. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, that is like, okay, you know, it's like, okay, what was, what was France around, you know, like Paris around the 1900s exactly? It's like, okay, it was about this kind of experimental kind of thing. And you do the same. It's, like, it's such a homage, such a nice smart homage that everything actually just falls into place. And I asked you when the last time you saw it was because I don't think I've seen this since, I would guess, around 2006, six seven. I would say like five years ago or so. I think that Did you tell me? Because we were friends at that point. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I thought <laughs> the same. Uh, but no, I think that I went to a Amoeba in the Haze and I bought a copy of it. Oh, wow. Yeah, I have like the original, like the DVD. So up until maybe two years ago, I had maybe 300 DVDs and I made a choice at the time that I'm going to keep 30 of these around and I'm going to give the rest to Out of the Closet. Yeah. One of the ones I gave to Out of the Closet was Romeo oh. plus Juliet. Oh, okay. I was really surprised. In my mind, I liked that film enough to keep it. Um, is there anything artistic oh my God, about this? All the time. All the time. As I was telling you about the media part, is that there is so many small details, small like, gestures, that is like, this is a such aesthetic exercise and the story is like I agree with you that the characters have not like full flesh but I also think that it's on purpose that I think that it's like he knows that the characters just building on top of Romeo plus Juliet is my characters are just vehicles of the story that I want to give I think that it's also like super smart I agree I think it's super smart I think there's a lot of layers to peel back like I'm guessing if I went into the trivia section on IMDb, there would be like countless references that I yep. missed. Um, so smart is a nice way to describe it because, yeah, Boss Lerman is clearly smart with good taste. Yeah. Is it a timeless piece? Yes. I, I mean, this has been like, what, like 25 years since it was released? I think or, 2001. Oh, 2001, so 20 years. Is it still like such yep, 2001. an engaging musical this I mean, yeah. I'm trying to think about it. It's like, okay, the next big musical was probably Chicago. And it's like, this feels way more 3D, way more vibrant than I saw Chicago. So I said this about the last two films. Like, if I watch them in 30 years from now, I feel like I'll get the same thing out of it. I still feel that like that's true, but Moulin Rouge will be exactly as if I watched it in 2021. <laughs> like, this true. is going to age so well. Yeah. Yeah, because it talks about like the beauty of love. Which is a timeless, timeless, yeah. <laughs> timeless story. So, would you turn this into a TV show? <sighs> a part of me would, would really love to have more of Morning Rouge, but I don't know if you can actually stretch this. When there is like this kind of time clock to them, you know, about like, she's going to die. You know it from the beginning. You say, like, why would you be stressing this out? And I also think, like, you have to suspend your disbelief to embrace the camp, to embrace the fact the characters are kind of placeholders. I don't think you can sustain that over, like, an eight-episode season or a ten-episode. At least I couldn't. So I would not turn this into a TV show. Yeah. But is your answer yes or no? I didn't understand. It's no. It's no. Okay. I don't think that you can actually just maintain, like, this value, you know, over many hours of TV. Could this movie no. have been better? No, I honestly look. It's as you said. It's like it's campy, but at the same time, it feels partially elevated. It's like I have no idea how you can just make this any better. I would agree. Um, in the same way that I wouldn't change anything about Romeo plus Juliet because it's just it's so unique and it's an experiment. I I feel that same way about Moulin Rouge. I feel like it succeeded more, yep. but I would never tell, like, Boz, you know, if you had really just developed Nicole Kidman's childhood, <laughs> like, we could have gone, no, yeah. this is a, this it is a great film. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's, like, it's not the point of the movie. 
Exactly. Yeah, the point of the movie is about like love, love being like everything. So we're going to score it, and honestly, I had a score picked out. I don't know if go, I want to increase score. it. You're going to be scoring this one first. I scored the two other ones first. So I'm going to go. Originally, my score was eight. I'm going to bump it up to an eight point five based on this discussion. Yeah, my score originally was also going to be eight. It was going to be like six, seven, and eight. <laughs> but he's like, honestly, I like this movie like way more than the suit. You know, and it's that like, that actually means that the movie is good. You know, the movie is like just amazing piece it may feel like just tacky it may feel like just didn't we watch a movie that originally oh Ice White Sat it's like originally it was felt like this is completely dumb you know it's only because just putting like an orgy in there and it's like now when we sort of look at it in perspective it's like it's not only about the aesthetics or the orgy it's like there is like significantly more to it I don't think that this movie has significantly more to it but it's like what it tries to do is like it shows like such a strong direction from the perspective that like, I want to make a movie about love and I'm going to be like making it in 1900 Paris and I'm going to be using like modern music on it it's like all everything almost feels like you're not going to succeed on this. This is insane. And that he could actually pull this out. It's incredible. It's an interesting comparison to Ice White Shut because Ice White Shut also doesn't give us much in terms of character development, in terms of dialogue, but it's all about like a sense of mood and a, a style. And we both agree it succeeded remarkably. I would say I would say the the Moulin Rouge succeeds in that same way, but feels different oh, yeah. because it's more lighthearted, campier. Exactly. Yeah. But also terribly tragic. <laughs> I mean, it's terribly tragic, but at the same time, it's like it doesn't try to give such a deep message as Ice White Sad does. Ice White Sad goes like significantly beyond, and it succeeds. You know, this movie tries to. I think that it's bold to actually say, "Look, I'm going to be like making a movie about love." And yeah, you can be Gaspar Noé and just having like just basically porn playing on the screen. So would you would you call Ice White Shut elevated? Yes. Would you call Moulin Rouge elevated? <laughs> Let me answer while you think about it. I would not have said I felt like it was elevated until after this discussion, and now I think he really did achieve something that's above the usual stuff. It's above. It's above, but at the same time, it's, like, it's almost like just doing... Imagine that you're going to be like doing a burger. And then you do the burger like amazingly well, but it's still a burger. It's like you have made like the best burger that it can be done, but it's still a burger. You can use like wagyu beef or whatever, or Kobe beef. It's, like, it's still a fucking burger. It doesn't change. It's that like people are still going to be like just putting pickles on it and putting ketchup. Is it does it turn into something else? No, it's still a burger. And I had a feeling that this is still a musical. I think that that's Are you calling musicals burgers? I still think that, for example, Dancer in the Dark tries to break the mold more than this guy. More than Basler around here. I will say that Ice White Shed makes you think. It makes you yeah. look for metaphors and yep. analogies. Moulin Rouge doesn't do that, but the emotional impact, I would say, is equal to Ice White Shed. Okay. No, that's fair. That's fair. I think that is it. That's what, as you said, I love like, that story about like you just texting your husband. I love it. I think that it's a very I I made me hate myself. I'm like, I'm not this guy that cries in movies and sends his husband's message. I mean, I should. My couples therapist said that I need to say I love you more. <laughs> but uh, it definitely impacted me. I was very impressed. No, that's cool. I mean, because that actually means that it works. It's like for me, it didn't make me like, just want to test anyone or anything. But it felt like this is... This is nice. I mean, it feels. I mean, I feel like just move with the scene that she actually chooses him, you know, and they just sing "Come What May" on the stage. You know, it feels like everything. It almost feels like a how do you say, like just setting the stage up. And I love how smart the script is for actually just playing the same story twice. So it's almost like what um, what it lacks in intellectualism. Compared to Eyes Wide Shut, it makes up for an emotional impact. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it's like emotional impact is that like we are humans. It's like we are solely watch Eyes Wide Shut. We have, we can have also like a, how do you say, like emotional impact out of Eyes Wide Shut. There is nothing that tells us that we cannot have of that. It's like, well, this is elevated, so we cannot have emotional impact. It's like you can feel moved by that. Uh, but they play their cards so well that I felt this is better than I thought that he could do with a strictly battle. 
is that he That's went, a good point. Yeah, he actually grew up like more and more. It's like you know your strengths, and now you actually learn how to use them. And that's the reason why I feel so disappointed about Australia. Is like how come after this? You actually go and just do Australia. So we both watched the films chronologically. So there was Romeo plus Juliet in the middle, which I feel is like a perfect stepping stone between the two. But yeah, if you compare Strictly Ballroom to the, <laughs> clearly a talented director, but then like Moulin Rouge, it's like, wow, the journey he went on between the three films. So you didn't actually give me a score. I told you, 8.5 too. 8.5. Yeah, 8.5. It's like, I, I, for a second, I was thinking, is this a 9? Is it denying his... I don't know, for me it's a bit more of a, this is like if I were to do like a 100 movie list, I would go with this. It would, and probably I would go with this, but towards the back. You know, but okay, I had to just think about a musical, that's the end of that. I had to think another musical. Okay, no Rouge. <laughs> not the mermaid. No, not no, the, no. Hang, the hunger. Yeah. <laughs> no, not the hunger. Um, all right, so it's this interesting. This actually closed the Red Curtain trilogy. It does. So you gave us, I gave a 6.5, 7.5, and 8.5. You gave a 6, 7, and 8.5. This yep. is not what I expected when we chose all three films at all. I'm pleasantly surprised at how much I enjoyed all three yeah. movies. Yeah, because I mean, if it was like a 6 and a 6.5, I think that we can agree that a Strictly Barroom felt like an enjoyable movie to watch. Yeah. Like, I'm going to be like spending 90 minutes in front of the TV yeah. and it's, it's engaging. It's like, okay, yeah, I want to see their moves, I want to see like the stupidities that they do, I want to see like the kid saying like, but I want to dance, what is wrong with my dancing moves? I love those scenes, but it's, like, it's stupid, you know, it's like, it's nothing elevated, it's just fun. Yeah. Well, great pick. I'm glad yeah. you chose Boz Lerman, and yeah. I made us watch all three. I'm happy that you actually made us watch it, because it felt like this has been six hours in two days, and it has been... Probably one of the most enjoyable cinematic experience that I had in the world. Which just blows my mind because yeah. I agree with you. This yeah. is so weird. Yeah. This shouldn't be this good, but it was. So, what are we going to be watching this? So, I'm going to give you two choices because oh uh, Memorial Day weekend is coming up. Um, yeah. There's still a pandemic. So, I picked one that's in theaters here called. The Killing of Two Lovers. It has fantastic reviews. It's totally my type of film. Very dark. Very, very sad. Happy people. Oh, yeah. um, but then I also want to give you the choice, and I'm not going to get the title correct exactly. I think it's Those Who Wish Me Dead. It's the new Angelina Jolie film that is both in theaters and on HBO Max. So just based on your schedule... What is what is the movie about? The second one, the one with Angelina Jolie. It's about Angelina Jolie. Hackers was about I honest to God, I don't know what the movie's about. It has a like a sixty five percent on Rotten Tomatoes. It's a murder mystery. Mm. It's something that I will enjoy, I know. But because artistically there. Yeah, yeah, of course. Artistically, the killing of two lovers is going to be ahead of this. But again, it's Memorial Weekend, we're traveling, so whatever yeah. you have time for. Let's let just try to watch uh, the killing of two lovers. All right, deal. Let's try that. Let's try that. Is that we may actually change. I will let you know. I will try to actually have like I have someone visiting this weekend. I may <gasps> actually just say, is that, "Okay, let's just walk, watch." Is it your sister? No, it's not my oh, sister. Okay. But thank you for asking. Thank you for your aunt, me. uncle. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, so let's just plan to uh, the killing of Chilovers. Okay. And we may actually need to adjust. So you just tell me by Sunday at 10 a.m. Yeah. what yeah. you pick. Yeah, I would do that. Okay, so this was a super interesting exercise. We may need to just... I mean, can you think of any other trilogy that is like so lightweight at this? Honest to God, I would love to do the Golden Heart trilogy. Oh my God, that's not, that's not like hard. Oh, you said lighthearted? No, yeah. there's no lighthearted trilogy. There is another one. What? But it was like the other one that was going to be like giving you as a choice. I may choose it in the future. That is actually the Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, Song of the Death, Hot Fuzz. And it will send. Okay, okay. We may discuss it. All right. All right. Uh, and to all of the audiences, like, thank you so much for putting up with us in the same duration of the Strictly Bar Room. <laughs> uh, anything else to say to them? Wash your hands. Okay, bye.